Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 91, Khrushchev Grows Up. Sorry for missing last week's podcast, but the strain of moving the family home was just too great, and I had to take the week off. That won't be happening for a while because I'm going into surgery tomorrow morning to uh, repair a torn Achilles tendon, and I've got to be laid up for a while, and guess what kind of books are going to be next to my bedstand, along with my... Uh, friendly notepad and computer. I'll be writing lots of scripts because I won't be able to do very much else for the next week or so. So you're not going to be missing out on any one uh, episode for a while. But I also want to thank uh, one of my listeners, Stephen, for the comment he made on episode 72 entitled Comrade Lenin, We Hardly Knew You. He stated that I had, quote, not just an anti-Lenin and Soviet bias, but anti-socialist bias as well. Well, I could say I'm guilty as charged, but with a bit of a caveat here. Understand that my family was forced out of the country because of the revolution. My mother was hunted down by the communists in the last stages of World War II, and I lost an uncle, likely in a gulag, after the war, so the scars run kind of deep. Also, millions of people died of starvation due to the ideals of developing a so-called socialist state in Russia, and many of these people really didn't need to die. And why do I say so-called? Well, while they talked the talk, they did not walk the walk. Stalin and many of his compatriots up on top, like Khrushchev, Molotov, Voroshilov, and the rest, lived in dachas that were owned by the Romanov family and other noble families, and very neat digs. And they uh, also ate really well while the people starved. So when you talk about socialism, uh, you talk about an even playing field, not where some people have all the luxuries and the other people starve to death. Uh, and yeah, I sometimes deviate from a solid objective stance, but it's something I believe in, and I'm not going to shirk from that. Still, I appreciate the comment. I really do. Thank you, Stephen. And the discussion that ensued on the Facebook fan club page, uh, which I really heartily recommend to all my listeners. Um, just meeting some fantastic people there from all over the world, and uh makes me feel good that, you know, we have these type of discussions where we can discuss things in Russian history and also learn new things that uh, I didn't know from the books. Well, having said that, let's move on. Well, last episode, I gave you an overview of Khrushchev's childhood in poverty and his joining the Bolshevik party. Today, I want to continue following Nikita's improbable climb up the Communist Party ladder. By now, Khrushchev was a trained fitter working for the Boss and Genefield Engineering Works and Iron Factory. But that didn't last very long as Nikita was fired when police notified his bosses that he was raising money for the families of murdered Lena Goldfield mine strikers in May of 1912. He was a very social man who began to read and discuss radical social ideas while courting countless women and working hard to earn more money and move up socially. Khrushchev was playing both sides of the fence. Capitalism and socialism both worked for Nikita those days. More and more, Khrushchev became increasingly radical in his beliefs. By March 1915, he was one of the leaders of a strike at the Ruchinkova mine. By 1917, he was elected chairman of the Ruchinkova Soviet, but not as a Bolshevik. As he put it, I was known as something of an activist, but I did not become a party member until 1918. When people asked me why I did not join earlier, I explained that in those days, joining the party was not the same as it is now. No one campaigned or tried to convince you to join. There were many different movements and groups, and it was difficult to keep them all straight. When the revolution took place, I decided on my position immediately. Well, according to Taubman in his biography of Khrushchev, this account is, quote, particularly inept. He also feels that Khrushchev, due to his being better off than the average man, was likely more of a Menshevik than a Bolshevik, and only chose sides when he saw which way the wind was blowing. It was not the first time he would act this way, especially when the battles began between Stalin and his adversaries. In late 1918, he joined the Red Army to fight in the brutal Russian Civil War. His unit was the Ninth Army, a particularly rough bunch. 
There are mixed reports on how brave Khrushchev was during the war. Actually, it depends on who wrote the report. If it was a friend, you would think he was a war hero. If it was an enemy, you would believe he hid in fear the whole time. Likely, it was a combination of both. After the war, though, he was charged with helping to rebuild the abandoned mines and foundries of the Donbass region as a commissar because of his service in the war. Here, in 1923, Khrushchev made what could have been a deadly mistake. He briefly sided with Trotsky over Stalin. As he put it in his memoirs, In 1923, when I was studying at the workers' training uh, site, I was guilty of a Trotskyite wavering. I was distracted by Karachenko, what was a rather well-known Trotskyite. I didn't stop to analyze various tendencies in the party. All I knew was this was a man who had fought for the people before the revolution, fought for workers and peasants. By July of 1925, Khrushchev was made party boss of the Petrovo-Marinsky district. His new wife, Nina Petrovna, was a Bolshevik party propagandist and a very vocal supporter of the party. I say wife loosely, which may be a surprise, but Nikita and Nina did not register their marriage until after he retired in the 1960s. At the 14th Party Congress in Moscow in late 1925, Khrushchev got to meet Stalin for the very first time. This Congress was the one where Stalin defeated his rivals Zinoviev and Kamenev. So impressed by the boss, Nikita went full in against Stalin's enemies, which caught the eye of a trusted associate of Stalin, one Lazar Kaganovich. By 1928, Kaganovich had first transferred Nikita to Kharkov, then the capital of the Ukraine, and then to Kiev, where Khrushchev worked with Nikolai Demchenkov. Now, 35, he wanted to further his education, or so the story goes. By 1929, Khrushchev was in Moscow, enrolled in the Stalin Industrial Academy, but he was destined not to finish. His political career was on fire. Here he met Stalin's wife, Nadja Alaluyeva, whom he worshipped, but there was little evidence that this did anything to advance his career, although Nikita thought it did. As Taubman puts it in his biography of the man, quote, between 1929 and 1938, Khrushchev's career rocketed upward. May 1930, head of the Industrial Academy's party cell. January 1931, party boss of the Bauman district, in which the academy was located, followed six months later by the same job in Krasnoprezhensky, the capital's largest and most important borough. January 1932, number two man in the Moscow Party Organization itself. January 1934, Moscow City Party Boss and member of the Central Committee. Early 1935, Party Chief of Moscow Province. Also, a region about the size of England and Wales with a population of 11 million people. Even in an era of extraordinary upward mobility, Khrushchev's was stunning. Yet during the same decade in which he reached his heights, his country experienced nothing short of a holocaust. Now, it was at this time that the collectivization project of the entire agricultural system of the USSR occurred, with somewhere between 10 million kulaks, or near 10 million kulaks, perishing in one of Stalin's countless purges. Because of the grave concerns of many in the government over the ferocity of collectivization, Stalin was forced to murder all doubters during the Great Purges. With all the openings, it's easy to see how Khrushchev moved up so quickly. Was Nikita complicit in the terror sweeping the Soviet Union? Undoubtedly. Taubman questions Khrushchev at this time by saying that, quote, until 1935 or 1936, it was possible for someone like Khrushchev to believe in Stalin. After that, it was too late not to. He and others like him were trapped. The cost of resistance was death. The only way to save your skin and your family was to kowtow to the great leader, 
the Vorst. Now you would think that after he retired, Khrushchev would use this defense of his actions, but he didn't. Instead, he denied knowing what was going on, and that he was deceived by Stalin and other henchmen like Beria. I personally find it unimaginable that he didn't know. But then again, I've not walked in his shoes, so I can't say for certain. Even though he had achieved lofty positions in the Moscow districts, it was when he was named second in command to Kaganovich that Khrushchev really knew he had made it. Ernst Holman had this to say about the two men he had worked under. Quote, Neither Khrushchev nor Kaganovich was yet spoiled by power. Both were simple and straightforward in a camaraderie sort of way. Both were accessible, especially Nikita Sergeyevich, that wide-open Russian soul who wasn't ashamed to keep learning, to ask me, his subordinate, for explanations of scientific wisdom that was beyond him. But even Kaganovich, who was drier in personal contacts, was not yet as stern as he would become. He was almost soft, and of course did not allow himself the tricks, the shouting, and the cursing, for which he later became infamous in imitation of Stalin. The next new big job now given to Khrushchev was the building of the Moscow metro train system. It was a massive undertaking, and it cost more per year than the cost of all Soviet consumer goods during 1934. Here he began to work with Moscow Mayor Nikolai Bulganin, a man he was to work with closely when he took over running the USSR in the mid-1950s. The work on the metro began in 1931, with the first trains beginning their run on May 1, 1935. Thousands died building the deep tunnels, which were to be a blessing when the Nazi bombers attacked the city in 1941. Khrushchev was given the Order of Lenin for his work on the metro. The building of the subway system was the same time that the zinoviev kamenev trials were held. Khrushchev was all in on Stalin's position when he said that it was time to, quote, educate the masses in hatred for the enemy, hatred for the counter-revolutionary Trotskyite Zinoviets, hatred for the rightist deviationist heretics, and love for the party of the Bolsheviks love for the boss and teacher, Comrade Stalin. By this time, all too happy to help Stalin with the Great Purge. As Khrushchev put it in August of 1937, quote, These scoundrels must be destroyed, and destroying one, two, or ten of them, we are doing the work of millions. That is why our hand must not tremble, why we must march across the corpses of the enemy towards the good of the people. Khrushchev helped purge and murder many of his co-workers and friends in Moscow. As Taubman puts it, Khrushchev assisted in the arrest and liquidation of his own colleagues and friends. Of 38 top officials of Moscow City and province party organizations, only three survived. Of 146 party secretaries of other cities and districts in the Moscow region, 136 were, to use the post-Stalin euphemism, repressed. Of 63 people elected to the Moscow City Party Committee in May 1937, 45 presumably perished. Of 64 in the Province Party Committee, 46 disappeared. By 1938, Khrushchev was sent to, by Stalin to the Ukraine to take over as head of the region. Nikita Sergeyevich was nervous, as he wasn't sure of his abilities. Returning to Kiev, he proceeded to conduct his own purge, with numbers estimated at around 275,000 people being banished or executed. After the molotov von ribbentrop non-aggression treaty was signed in 1939, Khrushchev was fast at it rigging the elections in the western Ukraine and Belarus, installing candidates who proceeded to agree to join the USSR. Troops of the Red Army seized control of whatever cities hadn't capitulated earlier to the annexation agreed upon between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Well, now we move up to June 21, 1941, and Khrushchev, returning to Kiev from a stay in Moscow, 
knew that the Ukrainian defenses were unprepared for attack. Well, they should have been, because the very next morning at 3 a.m., the Nazi invasion was on with their bombing of Kiev. The Khrushchev family left Kiev for the temporary Soviet capital of Kuybyshchev, south of Kazan, on July 2nd. Nikita was not to see his family for almost two years while working feverishly to help in the war effort. One he would never see again was his son Leonid, who died in the war as a pilot on March 11, 1943. General Kudaikov sent a letter to Khrushchev on the search for his son's body. Quote, we organized a careful search from the air and dispatched partisans on the ground, but without results. For the next month, we held out hope, but circumstances and the passage of time compel a sorrowful conclusion. That your son, Senior Lieutenant Leonid Nikitich Khrushchev, died the death of the brave in battle with the German invaders. Khrushchev's recollection of the moment, which he recounted in his memoirs, went as follows. Leonid was a pilot, died in battle. It was war, and many good men died, as they do in every war. What's strange about this is that it is one of only two mentions of his son in over 2,000 pages of memoirs. Theirs, as you might gather, was not a happy relationship. With the Germans advancing toward Kiev, Khrushchev wanted to abandon the city, but Stalin told him under no circumstances should his men give up despite the overwhelming odds against them. Khrushchev got out, but not the hundreds of thousands of citizens and soldiers who died or were captured by the Nazi army. The next disaster was the Kharkov counteroffensive of May 1942. General Timoshenko and Khrushchev believed that they could smash the German army, but the exact opposite occurred. After a bulge was formed by the Red Army exposing their flanks, the prepared German army crushed them, killing 67,000 and capturing 200,000. Stalin was obviously not too pleased, and Khrushchev felt that his life was now on the line. He had every right to be frightened, and the summer, at a meeting with Stalin, the boss dumped ashes from his pipe on Nikita's bald head, commenting, That's in accordance with Roman tradition. When a Roman commander lost a battle, he lit a bonfire, sat down in front of it, and poured ashes on his own head. In those days, that was considered the greatest disgrace a commander could endure. Even though he failed at both Kiev and Kharkov, Khrushchev was placed on the Stalingrad Military Council. This was going to be the crowning glory of his great grand patriotic war participation. He was there, in Stalingrad, exhorting the men to fight back the Nazi invaders. That's what got him noticed. He was extremely proud of his conduct, but not so proud as to take any of the glory away from Stalin. That, he knew, was not good for anyone's health. Before the war ended in 1944, Khrushchev was sent back to the Ukraine to rein in nationalism that had sprouted up and to rebuild the devastated region. Again, citing Taubman, quote, Ukraine's share of the losses were, was proportionately even more staggering. About 5.3 million, or one in every six inhabitants, killed. An additional 2.3 million shipped to forced labor in Germany more than 700 cities and towns, and 28,000 villages in ruins, 16,000 industrial enterprises, and 20,000 collective farms completely or partially destroyed, 40% of the national wealth gone. Now, a civil war ensued in the Ukrainian western side, which caused untold suffering and loss of life. By early 1947, Stalin dismissed Khrushchev as party leader in the Ukraine, replacing him with Iron Lazar Kaganovich. Nikita also became very ill, likely due to all the stress of the war, and he almost died. Later in the year, though, he was reinstalled as party leader and began the project he was very proud of, the reconstruction of the Ukraine. His work made him noticed again, 
and gave him a promotion, a promotion to Stalin's inner circle in Moscow. Well, now we've gone full circle and come to the point of the last days of Stalin and the first ones of Khrushchev as party leader. Next time, we'll cover the Hungarian crisis, I promise. The first major crisis of Khrushchev's rule, one that would make him powerful enemies, yet turn him into one of the most powerful men in all the Soviet Union. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. If you haven't checked it out yet, you can get the Russian Rulers iPhone app at the iTunes store. Also, please don't forget to join us on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast Group, where you can ask a question, make a suggestion, or leave a comment. So, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.